I am S-Translators and welcome to Amsterdam in the Netherlands where we've just wrapped on day one of the Ekrams 2022 conference. Hopefully by now you know me, my name is Brett Drummond and I am one of the co-founders of MS Translate and it's my pleasure to be joined by our special guest here in Amsterdam. Hi, Dr. Travis Stiles, CEO of Nova Round Bioscience and member of the MS Translate team. And Eric's here too, behind the camera, just so you know, it's important. And so as we do, Every time we attend one of these conferences, we're going to give you a small insight into the presentations that we heard today, give you a summary of some of the most interesting things that we've heard. As always, do follow all of our other platforms as well. We've been live tweeting the conference throughout the day, so do follow us on Twitter as well for other updates. And the Ectrums podcast, which Brett is going to be, I don't know, MC? Is that what we call it? Hosting. Hosting. We planned this earlier. We rehearsed this much better earlier. Um, it's fair to say that being back at an in-person conference was has been very tiring, um, but we're going to get through talking about all of these things. So just to remind everyone about what Ectrums is. So Ectrums is the largest MS research conference in the world, held at the end of every year. This year we have about 8,600 participants uh, here in person a couple of other thousand people participating online because it's a hybrid conference. So let's start uh, by talking about the keynote presentation that we heard today, so the, the Ekrams lecture that was given to us by Professor Brenda Banwell from the University of Pennsylvania and she focused on talking about paediatric MS and giving us a new perspective on what they've learnt over the past 20 years. Uh, we were not going to actually talk too much about that talk today other than to say that there were some fascinating insights from that because Dr. Banwell was our first guest on the Ectrums podcast. Uh, and QR so code. That episode that I recorded with Brenda uh, will be available before the start of day two. It's available through the Ectrums app if you are one of the people in attendance at the meeting or for all of those of you that may be watching at home, uh, you can find that podcast episode on uh, Apple Podcasts, also on Spotify and all other major podcast platforms. So certainly do give that a listen. Uh, Brenda shares a number of really uh, interesting insights about the research into pediatric MS, but also just the changes that have happened over the past 20 years, including some really personal insights um, about what's happened between her and her patients and how that's changed um, as the treatment landscape has changed and new insights have been found through research. And I think, I think for your audience, I think it'll be an interesting field to follow as well. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff that comes out of that line of research in terms of uh, potentially cleaning up some of our understanding of some of the genetic underlying factors and some of the triggers and, and whatnot. I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be an interesting field to watch as, as we're only just scratching the surface, but it already seems like they're finding some cool stuff out. Yeah, I mean, she mentioned one of the things that she mentioned was around Epstein-Barr virus, the ABV story. Now, we've seen a lot of interesting information about that in adult onset MS that's come out. The story isn't quite as concrete yet in pediatric onset MS, but it's probably a lot to do with the fact that those studies are, are a bit earlier, are a bit newer, and they're looking into more data. And I think, again, as you say, that will tell us a lot more about what's happening because when we look at children with MS, we're looking really early in the disease course. We're not looking at a whole heap of things that may have just happened based on having been living with multiple sclerosis for many, many years. And so we're trying to understand, is this something that's causing MS or causing part of the disease progression, or is this just a side effect um, of all of the inflammation and things that are going on? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one of the key topics that we want to talk about, because we know it is of particular interest to our audience, and obviously of particular interest to my esteemed guest to the right, uh, is remyelination. Now you sat in the remyelination session. What sort of updates can you provide our audience on the things that were discussed there? Yeah, the, remyel the remyelination sec section <laughs> sorry, session was interesting. We There was, uh, uh, there was more speakers than normal. I, I want to say there was five, um, but I'm, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they, we, it went all the way from uh, really trying to dive deep into some of the imaging endpoints that are going to be, that are that have kind of evolved and that are coming out in ways to image not just myelin changes in the brain, but can we specifically image demyelination versus remyelination and get outcome measures that can kind of help us understand the unique aspects of both. Um, and I got I, I found that very interesting. I think, you know, for me as somebody who's 
looking to hopefully do an, a remyelination try on the future, um, I always tend to pay a lot of attention to those things. And we're still very early on, but it's 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 cool to see that people are thinking how, how people are looking at the problem and trying to evolve kind of the, the paradigms in the field. Uh, and then then there was a, a couple other talks that were a little bit more uh, therapeutic focused. Um, obviously, you know, imaging endpoints are 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 are, obvi are also you know therapeutically uh, oriented, but there was a, a, a couple talks on novel therapeutic targets. Um, there was a, a specific talk on microglia and maybe trying to target microglia to get them to um, be to tip the scales in the microglia space to be more beneficial. Um, although that you know, as I think many people know, you can have both kind of kind of scenarios. Um, but the regular one pathway it was a it was the kind of the, the the centerpiece of that talk and and I think a lot of interesting things came out of there and that's really interesting to me in my work with Novron because uh, microglia and that norregulin cholesterol homeostasis myelin debris clearance kind of pathway is very central to what we do. Um, Can I jump in just really sure. quickly for people watching at home that may not be 100% aware of they may have heard the term microglia mm. but aren't 100% sure of what you're referring to with that. Can you just sort of explain what microglia are and how we think they may be yeah. involved in, in AMS? So really, if you want to oversimplify the brain, you really have, you have your neurons, and then you have three types of glia. You have your oligodendrocytes, which are the myelinating cells, and all of you, we're all familiar with myelin. Then you have your astrocytes, which are kind of this like broad workhorse, you know, sentinel maintenance, uh, astrocyte or uh, neuronal support kind of cell. And then you have microglia, which quite for, quite simply is, they're kind of like the macrophages or the immune sentinels of the brain. Um, and they're very very important for a lot of the debris clearance and keeping just keeping the space clean and, and everything kind of nice and tidy. Um, and so when you have an MS attack, you really want them to be efficient in coming in and cleaning up the the, the debris so that new repair can take place. And uh, the talk we, we witnessed today was about uh, some really interesting research and in how we might be able to tip the scales to make those cells more efficient. Um, uh, and then there was a, some really interesting stuff on some new therapeutic approaches targeting some potassium channels and showing that there tended to, there looks like a lot of the hyper like excite excite toxicity excitotoxicity sorry uh, it's been a long day um, uh, they by targeting some of these uh, unique kind of uh, uh, potassium channels and some of the interacting interfaces on microglia or uh, 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 oligodendrocyte progenitor cells and, and astrocytes that you can actually uh, promote some of the neural uh, the neural uh, neural protection and uh, improve outcomes. And so I, <clears throat> I did see a tweet, so I wasn't able to be in that <clears throat> session, but I did see a tweet from someone talking about uh, one of the quotes that one of the presenters had said about remyelination is currently the biggest challenge facing multiple sclerosis research. Um, do you agree with that? Just as a quick question, I I think so, but it's it's a bit subjective. But I think. You know, in terms of the mechanisms that we, the the kind of like we're still evolving and and how we understand the mechanisms that underlie kind of like insufficient remyelination, but also I think the imaging component of it because that is the real end all and be all is being able to prove that remyelination is taking place. Some of the deficiencies in our imaging approaches really make it difficult for us to have a robust endpoint that we can even know if we're having that effect. So, and I guess having now been to we've both been going to Ectrums now for a few years. Do you feel like we're making progress in the remyelination space sitting in through the session today versus sessions that you have sat through, say, in Stockholm a number of years ago? Do you feel... So, I mean, if, if I'm being honest, comparing those two sessions, it's it's difficult. They were, they were very different. Um, but I would say, you know, seeing the, the talks we had today and knowing some of the background context and some of the trials that I know are going on, I would definitely say that we're, we're making a lot of progress. And I think that more importantly than the progress we've made, I see the progress on the horizon for the next the next generation of advancements, and, and I think that's the most promising component. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so just to make people aware, if you are hearing some background noise, they are trying to pack up around us at the moment. We're sort of the last ones in the conference venue to do this video, so we hope you can still hear us clearly over the top of all of this. Uh, we'll make sure that on our platforms there are closed captions automatically generated that should hopefully help you with that. But we do apologize if you're hearing some stuff while they're doing that. Um, <clears throat> so I might just finish off with a couple of sessions that I was in quickly. One on biomarkers. So I've talked about biomarkers before on MS Translate as being things that we can measure in the, the blood or the, the CSF 
that give us some indication about disease progression or potentially treatment effectiveness. They're things that we can look at to monitor how things are going. Um, there were some interesting things talked about in that space in particular and one that I know will be of interest to a number of members of our community. Uh, there were four biomarkers that were talked about as being important in progressive MS. We know that, that people want to hear about progressive MS and what's happening in that space. And so these were different candidates that are being looked into at the moment that can do two things. Um, so one of them, or sorry, a couple of them were around being able to differentiate progressive MS for relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Um, and that could be important in terms of being able to uh, choose the most appropriate treatment option or to be able to give individuals um, a clear prognosis um, about what might be going on. Uh, but probably more importantly um, in that space was some biomarkers that can predict disease progression for people with progressive MS. And so this will be helpful to be able to tell someone whether or not their rate of progression is going to be quick or slow. And hopefully, especially as we start to get more and more options for treatments for progressive MS, which we hope will come in the in the near future. Um, <clears throat> you know, at the moment we have saponamod for secondary progressive MS, and we have ocrelizumab, which has been seen to be effective for primary progressive MS, even if it's not necessarily regulatorily approved for it in a lot of places around the world. Um, <clears throat> that this will help guide decisions around the most appropriate treatments um, for them as well. So some interesting work going on in that biomarker space. As I said, it's all candidates at the moment, so we need to see more testing done on those to see how they hold up. I got to say, though, I was actually really encouraged when you came out of that session that it wasn't just a lot of neurofilament and stuff. Like I, I, that, That's been something that's frustrated me is that we've been very fixated on that kind of singular space for a while, it's encouraging to hear that we're actually starting to branch out and find some new stuff. Yeah, so neurofilament was discussed. It is the one that I think we've all heard about. We've talked a lot about on MS Translate recently as well. But it, as you say, it's good to see that they're looking into other ones and other ones that may also have, you know, well, neurofilament may tell us a little bit about treatment effectiveness. It's sort of a general marker of nerve damage. These are some other ones here that, you know, may also give us some extra information. So continuing to look into in that space. And then I also had a couple of talks um, looking at more the treatment landscape uh, and I'm just going to touch on these ones really briefly because we're going to have some extra content on some of them either on the podcast um, or potentially on some other uh, things that we do around the conference. So one was looking at uh, AHSCT in a real world setting, so hematopoietic stem cell transplant in a real world setting but comparing outcomes um, with AHSCT versus other highly effective therapies. So there were comparisons with fingolimod, with nataluzumab, and with ocrelizumab. And what they found in terms of relapse activity anyway, is that AHSCT was um, far superior to fingolimod. Um, it was slightly superior to nataluzumab, though only really slightly. Uh, and there was no difference with ocrelizumab. Hmm. So what's I think interesting in this space is now we've sort of shifted from discussing AHSCT as a potential treatment option for multiple sclerosis um, and is it effective to now more where does it fit in with our other effective therapies and how should it be used for people living with multiple sclerosis and I think you were talking about it you mentioned it in one of your sessions they mentioned some stem cell transplant stuff as well as being one of the you know most effective ways of stopping the inflammation that's going on the most effective way yeah and so, you know, I think, again, we're starting to see a shift in those discussions. It will be interesting to see how they progress. Um, and the other talk that I heard in there was around um, individualized or uh, treatment dosing. So starting to think about whether or not with some of our treatments, in particular nataluzumab and ocrelizumab, whether or not we can start to shift um, the timelines in terms of how we give those um, treatments either to do it on a personal level, so to monitor each individual and decide when is the best time to give uh, their person the next dose, or even just looking at shifting the guidelines around that, seeing whether you know the current spacing that's used to give treatments can be extended, because they've seen that extending those um, the timeframes out between doses can still give the same effectiveness while reducing a lot of the risks with it. And one of the things they talked about in particular with nataluzumab was um, extending that period out, uh, really greatly reducing the risk of PML, but still maintaining the same sort of mm -hmm. disease control as the, the shorter time frame. That's a big deal. 
Yeah, and so I think what's exciting about that is the idea that we're moving, you know, we've got these highly effective therapies, but it's not, and you've talked about this a lot in terms of getting to the point of having a therapy, but also I think now that we have therapies going, okay, even though we've now got the therapy, let's think about how we can optimize yep. the use of this therapy um, for people living with MS. And yep. that, that's a big thing for you in terms of development. Yep. And I think we should probably cut it short because I think they're about to start vacuuming over there. Okay. Well, that was the last thing that I wanted to talk about anyway. So that is the end of day one. As I said, follow all of our platforms. Make sure you do listen to the Ekrams podcast um, to hear the interview that I did with Professor Brenda Banwell. Stay tuned tomorrow as we will be doing our day two summary. Lots more exciting talks to, to come with that. And as always, make sure you do follow all of our different platforms platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, because we could be doing some cool things on Instagram that Travis is really excited about, uh, and our website and our LinkedIn page. For now, that's us signing off before we get kicked out of the venue. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, we look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Yeah.